Job chapter 1 is quite the story where we see the man Job suffering. It tells us how great of a man he was, how he had a great household. He was essentially a king and he had great power and resources that was given to him by God. And then Satan attacks his household. Now when Satan comes to attack, he usually puts it on pretty heavy. And that's what happens here with Job. He literally lost all of his wealth. He lost his business, his kingdom, his food source. He lost his friends and his servants. His children died. Satan was attacking extremely hard. I mean, it was full throttle. We see that the Sabians come with the sword and they attack and kill. Then we see fire come down and destroy. And that's what that's an interesting they say fire from God has come down from heaven. Now God allowed the hedge of protection to go away, but I believe this attack came from Satan himself. The devil was attacking Job and he sent fire down and consumed his servants and his sheep. Then another attack, the sword comes and attacks and steals even more. And then finally a great wind comes and knocks over the house that his children are in and it wipes out his family. Sometimes when Satan attacks, it's a big deal. It's full throttle. I do believe everyone here under the sound of my voice at some time or another, you could say my household has been under attack. My family has been under attack. My marriage has been under attack. I, even I myself alone, I know that the devil is attacking me. Sometimes God allows this to help us to grow. Sometimes it's problems in our life that we've invited in with sin that we just won't get right and God's protection is gone. What we do see about Job here is that God had some awesome things that He said about him. He had some very powerful statements about the man Job. If you'll look at verse number 8, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? i got to tell you, every time that God talks about Job, He says, My servant Job. This is a good thing. Uh, you know, One of the best things we can hear when we get to heaven is, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How about while you're still alive and on the earth, and God starts talking to you or about you, and He says, My servant, fill in the blank, put your name. Would you say, hey, let's make a name tag, God's servant, Adam. Like, that would please the Lord. That ought to be our mentality. Job had it right. Again, in verse 8, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. The message tonight is, how Job saved his marriage. Job lost everything that he had, but there's one thing he maintained here in his family, and that was his wife, that was his marriage, and by the end, God blessed him again and he had ten more children. What an awesome blessing. I praise the Lord that in this story, he did not uh, mess up and fail his family by losing his wife also. But I have to say this also, because I realize that not everybody in here is married. So I know there are some of you young ones that aspire to be married, and there are some of you elder ones that are, uh, you say, that was no more, I'm, 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 I'm alone. It is what it is. Um, I want to tell you, this is how you can succeed as an individual with God. That's really the message tonight. That's how Job was successful. So go to chapter 2. Satan comes back. Satan's on the attack. Here he comes. So Satan is back. And by the time you get to chapter 2, look what God says in verse number 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity? although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. I want to tell you, this is the answer. It's one word. How did Job save his marriage? Or how is it that you as an individual can be successful with God the rest of your days? It's this word, integrity. God's will is that every Christian would have integrity. It doesn't come easy. It doesn't come naturally. You have to fight to get it, but it's well worth it. 
God's going to give you all the resources that you need. He'll help you become the person that He wants. And He wants you to be a person of integrity. And you say, well, what is integrity? Let me give you a uh, worldly definition, a secular dictionary definition. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles or moral uprightness. Uh, the person at work with integrity, that's the one you can trust to do the right thing. That's kind of what they're saying. Here's another definition. It says the state of being whole and undivided, complete or perfect. Something that has integrity. If this table uh, ha was missing a leg, if we kicked out one of the legs and it had three legs, it's not complete. It's not perfect anymore. It's not a whole table. It's lost its integrity. And if you went to sit down on a three-legged table, table, you'd find out real quick you can't rely on it, right? Well, as Christians, we need to be the type of people you can rely on. Uh, a bridge. They'll evaluate it every year to look at its structural integrity, to make sure that it can handle the weight and do the job and complete the work without anybody getting hurt. Well, as Christians, we need to have that kind of integrity. Here's some synonyms, similar words that mean similar things as integrity, morality, virtue, honesty, goodness, character. That's a word I like, somebody that has good character. Now, now that guy, he's got character, right? Uh, that's integrity. Uh, rightness, ethics, morals, decency. Honor, uprightness, righteousness, virtuousness. Here's one. Incorruptibility. Uh, Brother Doug uh, taught in Sunday school what, a week or two ago about silver, that the Word of God is like silver. It's incorruptible. It doesn't rust like steel does, right? Well, that ought to be our character. That ought to be the person that you are. You have integrity. You're not easily corrupted. Um, correctness. Now, I want to give you the Bible definition. It's right here in Job chapter 2, verse number 3. There's a, there's a couple words in here that if you'll focus on them and ask God how you can be more like that, then you will find yourself on the path of integrity. Look at it again. He says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's number one. Putting God first. Are you God's servant? When you go to a restaurant. They serve you. They wait on you. We're told to wait on the Lord. Do you wait on the Lord by saying, what can I do for you, Lord? What do you need next? How else can you use me? When you wake up, you ought to, reporting for duty, sir. How can I serve you today? Oh God, what would you like me to do for you? That's serving God. Now we're called to be His servant. You have free will. You get to choose whether or not you're going to obey that commandment to be a servant of God. That's your choice. Somebody with integrity ought to be known as a servant of the Lord, not self-serving, not pleasing yourself, not always going after your own adventure, but considering, is the Lord in it? Is this God's will? So he says, my servant Job, look at it in verse 3, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect. Now, in the Bible, it must be said, the word perfect does not mean sinlessly perfect. There was only one man that was sinlessly perfect. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, perfect means complete. I use the illustration when, uh, when just about every baby we've had, the midwife goes, so they start counting toes and look at the eyeballs, then they go, perfect! And I'm like, she is, she's perfect. And it's like, well, that doesn't mean she won't sin or she hasn't messed up or, you know, maybe she's got her daddy's ears or nose or whatever, right? Or big old feet, but uh, they're perfect. And I say, amen, they are perfect in my eyes. And what she means is they're complete, right? That baby is complete. So when he says with Job that he was perfect, God is saying he's a man of integrity because he was, uh, well, here's a good verse for you where he talks about that we should grow up, he says, unto the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Uh, if mom or dad is this tall, uh, and you grow up unto the measurement, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. We've got some uh, children in here that are already taller than their parents, right? 
Uh, you have exceeded the measure of the stature of the fullness of your parent. Well, as a Christian, you ought to look like the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, it says, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. One day, your destination is heaven. And one day in the resurrection, you'll look just like Him. So, why don't you choose to grow up now and begin to live and look like the Lord Jesus Christ? That's your choice. When it's talking of Job, he was complete. That doesn't mean he never sinned when it says he's perfect. It means he was complete. And what that means is uh, God had a will for him, and he sought after that will. He obeyed God, and he tried to do everything to be the best son of God that he could. So we see that he was a servant. He says a perfect and an upright man. To have integrity means uprightness uprightness. Now, there's a few things we could compare to the opposite of upright. I am upright. I'm standing upright. Amen? Everybody agree? Now, if I were laying down on the job, you would say, well, that's not upright. Or how about this? If I were backsliding, that's a Bible word. What's a backsliding heifer? They don't want to go forward. They don't want to do the work. So they start going like this. Oh, I don't want to go do the work. Well, now as Christians, we need to be upright, walking, moving forward, attacking the gates of hell, not taking our hand off the plow, working for the Lord. When we do it, we walk in righteousness. Righteousness means to do the right thing. Now, we cannot earn our salvation by our own righteousness, but He has imputed His righteousness to us by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gift of righteousness that He's given to us, and now our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. But here with Job, He's saying this man, when he walks around in the earth and he deals with individuals everywhere he goes, he tries to do the right thing. This is very important. He's trying to do the right thing everywhere he goes. So look at it again. He says in verse 3, uh, he was a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God. Now, we read our daily proverb just a moment again, and, and what do he say? Uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He also says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. And then elsewhere in Proverbs, he says, the fear of the Lord is is the beginning of wisdom. God's trying to teach us something that every step you take, you need to recognize that there is a judgment for not doing the right thing. Now look, we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. So I'm saved by trusting in Christ, and now as a son of God, well guess what? My Father will correct me on the earth when I disobey Him, and therefore I should walk in the fear of the Lord. If you have a child that's rebellious and uh, anti-parent, and they don't want any authority, well, it's because there's no fear. There's no fear of judgment. And what happens? Well, that child, they'll get to a certain age, they'll go off into the world, and they're not afraid of the cops either, and the cops will lock them up and ruin their life if they get a chance. And so we need to train up our child, our children, in the way that they ought to go, and God's promise is they will not depart from it. Here, Job was probably raised right. We do see that he was trying to raise his children right, uh, but it says that he had a fear of God. If you want to be a person of integrity, you need to be a servant. You need to be perfect, which is complete. You need to be upright in your dealings with others. You need to be afraid of God. If you're not afraid of God's judgment on your life, then there's no telling what you'll do. There are those that don't want to retain God in their knowledge, and God gives them over to a reprobate mind. It talks about that their conscience is seared, and they go out and do all manner of abominable, wicked works, and it's like, the, it's like they're having a party until it all comes crashing down, and they suffer at the end of their life, and they end up in hell. Now, as a child of God, you're saved. He's not going to send you to hell. That's His promise and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He's not going to take it away but He will punish you. He tells us in Hebrews that if you're sons and daughters of His, there's a correction. He's going to chastise you. We need to walk in the fear of the Lord knowing when we step outside of the bounds of God's will for our life, He will correct us. He's not going to take away our salvation, oh, but He will correct us. 
Finally, look what he says. He says, uh, so he says, My servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, what does it mean to eschew evil? Uh, Lawson and I were talking about this before he read. Where'd he go? Uh, and to eschew evil. And I, I, here's the illustration I gave him. Use your shoe, okay? <laughs> to eschew evil, if that doesn't mean you run away from evil. That means you push it away. You say, I don't want any evil around me. Get out of here. Go away. Job was the kind of guy that if you came around him and you started telling a dirty joke or you started using God's name the wrong way or if you're a wicked, devious person, you're plotting on stealing from somebody or hurting somebody, he would, he would stand up for what's right and he would run you off. That's the type of Christian we ought to be. Too many Christians, they're afraid, they've gone in the closet, they're like, I'm just surrounded by bad people, I don't know what to say. Man, God has given you the Holy Spirit, and you know the truth, we need to speak up, and we need to run off evil. We need to get it out of our life. We need to get it out of our house. Notice he says after this, and he says, And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan wanted to absolutely destroy everything about his life, and Satan's attack was coming on very hard. Now, of David, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. David used the scriptures and the word of God, the knowledge of God, the relationship with God to empower him to maintain his integrity. David is another man that God said had integrity. To Solomon he said in 1 Kings 9, And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments. He's reminding this, man, this young man who's now the king, he says, Your dad had integrity. He did what was right. He was doing my will. He was keeping my laws. Now David was a flawed man, wasn't he? But his heart was right with God. He was tender when he was corrected with his sin. Job's the same way. Job was a sinner. David was a sinner. I'm a sinner. And so are you. When we find ourselves compromised or failing or falling according to God's word, we need to have integrity of heart and respond quickly and keep a short account with God. We need to make it right quickly and not put that off. And well, I'll fix that one day and I'll get around to that sin one day. No, no, that is not healthy for your relationship with God. If we continue in Job chapter 2, look at verse number 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. What's he saying? Let me attack his body. And here's the funny thing about it. We work our whole life to get some money, and at the end of our life we'll give up all of our money to get a little more life. When you get sick, you'll pay whatever the price is to get your health back, won't you? When you start to realize that your health is slipping, doesn't it really hit home and you start saying, what else could I give? I want to stay around here a little bit more. I'm not quite ready. Now, some of us, we get to that point and it's like, Lord, come and take me home. Get me out of here. I'm ready for a new body, right? Uh, but he's trying to make this point. Let me attack his flesh and then we'll see who he really is, what kind of character and integrity he has. Verse 5, but put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. He said, Okay, you can hurt his body, but don't kill him. Verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Now that's got to hurt. You guys understand what a boil is? When you boil water, it bubbles up. He's talking about bubbles coming up under your skin that hurt. It's sore. I mean, it's like leprosy perhaps or something similar. All of a sudden, from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head, it hurts everywhere. There's big blisters all over him, and he is in a lot of pain. Now look at what Job does in verse 8. He took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Verse number eight is very startling. Number one, what's a pot shard? Shard of pottery. That's right. 
So a broken piece of pottery, that little piece that's left that can be sh as sharp as a knife, he hurt so bad he was scraping himself with sharp pottery. If you've had, who's had poison ivy so bad that you just couldn't contain yourself? Oh, man. And you knew it. And you're like, it's only going to get worse, but I can't stop. I've been there. Man, I had one time my whole arm was just swollen up. And it's like, I just, oh, it hurts so bad. There's nothing you could do about it because the pain is under the skin and it hurts on the top too. And it's just, oh, there's no relief. Well, that's how Job felt. But notice where Job went to sit down. Where is Job at? Notice what he says. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, that means all over, and he sat down among the ashes. These are the ashes of his friends, his servants, and his sheep that were destroyed in the, in the first chapter. When fire came down from heaven and it consumed his servants and the sheep, he's sitting down in the bloody, bony, hot, broken mess of the household that was destroyed. And there he is amongst his dead friends scraping this pain. Look at the next verse. Because this is Satan's attack. That was the second attack. Now he attacks his wife. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, i got to say, I've heard a lot of preachers give Job's wife a hard time. And I don't think that's right. Job's wife just lost ten children. They just lost the family business. The whole household is gone. Job himself is obviously plagued from head to toe and in a ton of pain. She's heartbroken. She's emotional. Now, notice what happens here. She didn't say anything until... Satan had permission to touch his flesh. You know, when you get married, two become one flesh. You know, sometimes your weakness is reflected in your spouse. Sometimes what you want to get angry at your spouse for, let's face it, guys, it's really your fault. Amen? 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 Amen. And God gives us a helpmate, a woman there that's perfectly suited for us to help us to become the man of God that he wants us to be. And sometimes she says things that we need to correct the right way. And we don't always correct it the right way, do we? No, we don't. Now, Job was a man of integrity, and because his whole life was focused on fearing the Lord. Now, think about it. The next time you get so angry, you're mad at your spouse, and you just want to yell at them and let them have it, you better stop and say, wait a minute. If I'm afraid of God, and He's given me this spouse for life, and I'm commanded to love them and serve them and help them and forgive them, I better mind my words before I say them. Because once you say it, there's no going back. Job's wife, we could argue that what she said was a sin. Why don't you just curse God and die? I think there's truth to it. I think if Job had lost his integrity at this point and said, that's it, I've had enough, God, why are you doing this to me? And shook his fist and said something wrong. God would probably say, well, <laughs> flatten you. He would have died. It's interesting, his response. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. First of all, men, I have to say it. This is a humble response. Please do not quote Job the next time you get in an argument with your wife. Okay? Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speakest. That's not going to work well for you. Okay? I do want to point out that he does not, listen to me guys, he does not name call her. He does not call her a foolish woman, does he? He said, the words that you said, you're speaking kind of like some of those foolish women, 
And I know you're not like those foolish women. He's contrasting her words. He's comparing her words to those I would believe that she despised. If this is a godly family, that I, I, we assume by the text that she's a godly woman and she also feared God and loved God and served God and trained up children for the Lord. She didn't like the foolish women. She probably pointed out to Job more than one. They're foolish. You hear what they say and they, they gossip and they backbite and they disobey and they have all this negativity to say. She probably didn't like the, their words. And so he does a good job of painting the scene and saying, no, wait a minute, if what you're saying sounds like something I would expect from an unsaved, lost, foolish woman that doesn't fear God. He's humbly reminding her who she belongs to. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women. What? Then here he asks this great question. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? We talked about this last week. I'll, I'll just say it again. In the Bible, the word evil does not always mean wicked. Evil means harm. The illustration, it talks about where God's speaking to the prophet, and he says, what do you see? And he says, figs. And he says, well, what kind of figs are they? And he says, figs that are so evil they can't be eaten. I have some rotten peaches at the house right now. We set them out for the chickens. They're so evil they can't be eaten. If I eat one of those rotten peaches, it will not do my body well. It will make me sick. It will do me harm. The word evil means harm contrasted to health, right? So a good peach would do me health. A bad peach would do me harm. He says, we receive good from God all the time. And if God has allowed some harm to come in our life, shouldn't we receive it as well? seeing that we walk before the Lord in the fear of the Lord, walking with our integrity, serving Him, whether it's a good day or a bad day. There's the roller coaster of life, and when you're up, serve God, and when you're down, serve God as well. This is the message we learn from them. Don't just serve God on the good days. Don't be a fair-weather Christian. Are we going to church? Oh, I don't know. I don't feel like it. And I'd rather do something else. And besides, my show's coming on. That's a fair weather Christian. We ought to say, I'm going to serve God, and everything else can take a back seat. And I want to go sing to God, and I want to encourage my friends. And I want to have fellowship. I want to hear the Word of God read. And I, want to, I want to learn more about God. That ought to be the priority. She says, curse God and die. He says, you speak as one of the foolish women. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, did not Job sin with his lips? It's interesting that Job did not fail God. He did not lose his integrity while he was under attack by the devil. In fact, go back to chapter 1 and look at the end of it. Chapter 1, if you look there, look at verse number 20. This is right after he got one, two, three, four bad news in a row, right? What's he say? Then Job arose and rent his mantle, that means ripped his jacket, and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. When devastating things happen in your life, do you humble yourself and worship God? That's what he's doing. Job had a nice robe. Job probably had great clothes. He was like a king of the east. He had a great household with a bunch of servants and all the resources you could think of. And God was using him to be a blessing and a protection to a whole bunch of people. And then it's like, you lost it, you lost it, you lost it, you lost it. And he's just, whoa, all of this has happened. I don't even know how to respond. And he rips off his nice clothes and he shaves off his hair, which is a sign of shame. And he falls down on the ground and he just starts worshiping God and telling God how awesome he is. Job was still alive. He had the ability to worship God. He was praying. He was seeking. I'm sure he wanted an answer why. In fact, we see that through the whole book. He does not understand why. Job will say, I maintained my integrity. I don't understand. The Lord's allowed it, and if He gives me evil and good, I'll take whatever God gives me. I just want to...
the Lord, and I want to know in my heart that I'm right with God. I don't want to look over my shoulder. If Job were in some big secret sin, he would have known it, and he would have confessed it. His friends certainly accused him of it. It says, he fell down to the ground, look at it in verse 20, and worshipped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. This is our human instinct. God, you're doing this, and I don't deserve it. Now, wait a minute. You don't deserve Calvary. You don't deserve the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't deserve forgiveness of sins, and He gave that to us. Boy, thank God for that. What we do deserve is punishment for our sin, and He's been merciful to us. He took our, our punishment, didn't He? Boy, thank God for that. Job did not accuse God foolishly. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Hey, guys, maybe here's one for you. Next time you, you get out of the shower and you're like, honey, do I have a t-shirt? Do I have some underwear? And she's like, oh, no, they're not clean. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall... You know, maybe you can try that one. Maybe that would help your marriage a little instead of getting mad because you don't have clean clothes, right? Job's response was, I had it all, and I lost it all. That's okay. God gave me the chance to have it. If you would, go to... Job chapter 27. Go to Job chapter 27. I tell you, Job had integrity throughout this whole situation. And I do believe that he was one of the greatest examples of an Old Testament prophet and saint that we, that we see. There's nothing negative really said about him. Although he had three friends that he later calls miserable comforters. And then he has this third young man that comes and falsely accuses him and twists his words. Literally, he says, well, Job, you said this, but we don't have any account of Job saying that. The kid, I believe, was a liar. Uh, Elihu, I believe he was like uh, the devil working through a young man as a final attack, trying to attack Job with the words of a person to get him to give up or to be angry with God. He kept his integrity. Now, integrity in marriage, when you say, I do, you just need to stay. You need to love. You need to keep up your part of the, the agreement. You need to be loving and forgiving. You need to pray for your spouse. You need to build them up. Build them up. You know what your job is? It's to build other people up, especially the one that you've committed to be with for the rest of your life. Now, we're talking about how Job saved his marriage, and I subtitle it, if you will, how you as an individual can have success for God. Well, it's to build people up. Did the Lord Jesus Christ come and tear people down because of their sin? No. He built people up. He encouraged them. He motivated them. He edified them. He exhorted them. Now, when it came time to rebuke the Pharisees, he did it. But we're not him, and we're not surrounded with Pharisees. I understand we live in a broken world. Your job in the simplest form is to encourage people in the Lord, to build them up. If you have integrity, then instead of gossiping about somebody that's weak, you'll pray for them. You'll encourage them. You'll lift them up instead of tearing them down. In the marriage, it's your job to build up your spouse and to help them become a better person. Even when they're difficult and hard-headed, that's the hard part. If we'll just do our part, which is, okay, as Christ laid down His life, so should I. And if the spouse is being difficult and stubborn, obstinate, hard-headed, not willing to, to work the way I want it to work, well, I'm still, as Christ, going to lay down my life, and I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to encourage them, I'm going to speak life into them, I'm going to love them, I'm going to forgive them, I'm going to point them closer to Christ. And if I can get them closer to God, as I'm trying to get closer to God, then we all get closer to each other. We should also protect them. We should provide for all of their needs, not just financial, but emotional needs, spiritual needs. We need to remind them of God's grace and mercy in our life. We need to remind them that God's been good to us in the past. Now remember here that Job lost everything, right? He lost his, his household, his cattle, 
his servants, his land, and then finally Satan attacks his wife. And I know today it's kind of like, yeah, he lost some chickens or something. What's the big deal? No, it's a little bit bigger than that. Back then, all of this cattle, I mean, this was, this was their income. This was their job, their production. It was their nutrition. I mean, this is where their food came from. It was their transportation. Uh, their whole economy revolved around getting food from their animals. It was a form of wealth that was transferable and tradable. I mean, everything that he had accumulated was for business dealings that he had going on. It was for feeding many mouths, and then all of a sudden they all die. What happened really was a big deal. And this isn't, this isn't um, I guess, the first time something like that's happened. It reminds me of the story when Jesus, when he's telling his disciples that he made a great supper and he bade many. He said, invite them all in. And then one after another, they came back with an excuse. I bought some land and I got to go see it. Wait, it's supper time. Why are you going to look at property? You're going to look at a house. Oh, I brought some oxen and I must go prove them. No, no, it's supper time. You're not going to go work. Oh, I've married a wife and I cannot come. Well, I'm married now. I can't go to church. I'm too busy. It's supper time. It's interesting that these are, there's, this, there's this interesting parallel that these are the things that may hold us back that are really blessings from God. If God gave you a wife, it's so you can get closer to Him. If God gave you a house, it's so you can establish that house to be a house of God and honor God in it and, and, and eschew the evil. Get it out. Sweep it out of the house. Don't let the house become a stumbling block and say, I can't serve God because i got to pay the bills for this house. Think about it. Isn't that, we come up with these excuses and reasons why we can't serve God. Jesus said in the regeneration, He said that there will be many that have forsaken houses and brothers and sisters and wives and all that. And He says, and you'll be rewarded for it. Don't let the stuff in your house, even your family members, become a stumbling block to you getting a blessing from God. Now you're in Job chapter 27. I want you to look at verse number three. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. You know what he's saying? His false accusing friends are saying, you did wrong, you messed up. That's why God's doing this to you. And he says, I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit and I have my integrity. I'm not going to accuse God of anything. And, I, you know, he says, I, I know that this is something bigger and God can do whatever he wants to do. In fact, look at verse 6. He says, Mine righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. You know, your righteousness, it, Job was outnumbered and his friends were saying, surely you did something wrong. Just admit you did something wrong. I have a friend, and several years ago, uh, he was at an event. Some stuff happened. Gossip gets around. It gets back. And he's being accused of saying something that he simply didn't say. And he received some unwise counsel. And they said, well, just admit to it and just apologize. And he said, well, apologize for what? Well, now, just apologize, and it'll be okay. It'll go away. He took that unwise counsel, and he did that. And so he called his preacher, and that's where it was all stirring around. He says, I I'm sorry. And he says, for what? Well, I I'm sorry for how it happened. Well, for what? Admit that you did it. And he's like, well, I, I didn't do it, but I'm sorry. And it just caused more confusion and chaos. And Job is trying to say here, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't have some big egregious secret sin that caused this. God chose to do it, and God's just in what he does. And I'm not going to justify my friends and lose my righteousness by saying, you must be right, I must have messed up. Job is saying, I'm keeping my integrity, and I'm going to do the right thing even if I'm outnumbered. Now go ahead to Job 29. Flip ahead two chapters. Job chapter 29. His false accusers tried to trick him into admitting fault. Job 29, listen to his prayer. He says, uh, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were, as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. 
Now here's a man that just lost everything. He says, man, if it was just like it was a few months ago when God was protecting me and I had everything. He's reminiscing of what God was doing for him. When his candle shined upon my head, and when his light as I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. He's mourning and lamenting. You know, God was still with him. The Holy Spirit was still there. But God was not answering him and letting him know why this was happening. And he's like, I don't know the answer, but I know one thing. God's always been good. Verse 6, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. Now, this is a parable. He's giving an illustration that life was really sweet. You know, it was butter and oil and everything was great and luxurious. God was good to me. All my children were here. Everywhere I go, I, I could see God working in my life. And now I have nothing. Again, he's reminiscing of what God had done. Now go to Job 31. And this is the ultimate answer. Um, I challenge you, men, to be a Job 31 man. Most of us have heard of the Proverbs 31 woman. Who's heard of such a thing? Well, this is the Job 31 man. There's 13 points or so in this chapter. I'm not going to give them all to you. I want you to find them for yourself, but I want you to see how Job kept his integrity. If you will look at verse 1. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Now, Job here is dealing with the issue. He says, look, I'm married. I have a wife, I made a promise before God, and I need to make sure that I'm not meditating on other women. This is a big deal. We live in a society where uh, there are people dress inappropriately, and inappropriate images are everywhere you go. This past month, I've had two different men try to convince me and tell me that it's not a sin for a man to look at pornography. And that's wicked. These are not just, you know, some bum on the side of the street. These are men that are, they, they know their Bible, they've read it through more than one time, they preach the gospel, and they're dealing with problems in their marriage, and they're justifying their sin of meditating on inappropriate images. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery already with her in your heart. He took, Jesus took it to a whole other level. Because they always say, oh, you can look, just don't touch. That's not what it says. That's not what it means. The essence of it is, is don't give in to always looking. Because then you're just focused on looking and looking and looking and looking, and you can't control yourself. And Job is trying to make this point here. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? And now listen, and you men know, you can... You go to the grocery store and there's somebody dressed inappropriately. But you know what you don't do? You don't stop and stare and take a mental picture and start thinking about it. And then you think about it later. And then it comes up to your memory later. You know what you do? You cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ. When you're faced with temptation, and you will be, if you want to be a man of integrity, you have to fight the good fight. And you've got to stand up for what's right. And you've got to walk in the fear of the Lord. You've got to say, God, I'm afraid of your judgment on my life. And I don't want you to take your blessing off my marriage. I don't want to give in to thinking about things that you don't want me to think about. Please help me with the Holy Spirit to fight this battle. That's God's will for his men. You want to be a man of integrity, then you have to fight this battle all day long, everywhere you go. You have to be vigilant and ready to go. If you were a, uh, a self, if you were a self-defense instructor, at the drop of the hat, you could pull out your gun and, oh, hey, we're ready to go, right? Most Christians. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. Here's a good one for you. Job 31.1. Put that in your heart. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? You know how Job was able to save his marriage and not lose his wife's heart? Not lose his integrity with God? Because all through his life, He's asked for God, help me to love my wife and help me not to be given uh, at looking at things inappropriately. 
Look at verse 2. He says, For what portion of God is there from above? He says, What's God going to give you? And what inheritance of the Almighty on high? Well, doesn't it tell us in Proverbs that a prudent wife is from the Lord? And if God's given you a prudent life, wife, you better look out. The devil's going to attack you and try to tempt you and try you, and you better control your mind. And it starts by getting off your cell phone. I got to say it. I mean, you know, don't let the TV. Well, it's football season. Yeah, those ads are evil. They're wicked. They're showing you perverse things. Turn them off. Don't look at it. Don't get on social media and stare at other people's wives and inappropriate acting foolish women. Don't do that. You're just creating corruption in your heart. You're meditating on things that want to hang out and stay around. And you don't need that if you're going to have a good marriage. You don't need that if you're going to have God's blessing on your life. He says in verse 3, is not destruction to the wicked. He's talking about judgment here. Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? He knows where you're going and he sees your ways, right? He made your eye. He knows what you're thinking and he sees what you're looking at and he knows what you're touching. He says, and he counts my steps. That doesn't mean like, you know, there's that app like one, two, three, four. That's not what it means. We in the judgment will give an account to God. And every step you take, every thought that you have, the Holy Spirit is your witness. And in the judgment you will give an account, neither you will suffer loss or you'll receive a reward. And if you fight the good fight and you stand up for what's right, and you ask for God's help to overcome temptation, then there's a reward. He says in verse 5, If I have walked with vanity, or my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. There it is again. This is the secret to a great marriage. Listen, if you're single, this is the secret to a great life. It's integrity with God. Maintain your integrity, do the right thing, be afraid of God. And he says, I'm going to be judged by God one day. I know that judgment's coming. So when it's time for me to get there, I'm just going to plan on it. I don't want to be like everybody else where all of a sudden you're dead and you're taken by surprise and you're standing before your creator and you're saying, no, I'm not ready yet. Rather, it ought to be, Lord, I've been preparing for this day my whole life because I knew it was coming. I'm sorry I'm not perfect, but I'm trying my best. I want to get closer to you. You know you're going to go stand in front of him at the judgment. Prepare now. Have integrity now. Plan on that day now. He says in verse 7, If my step hath turned out of the way, and my heart walked after my eyes. He's talking about being a covetous person. And if any blot hath cleaved to my hands... Then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. If I did evil and hurt others, then take my children, Lord. But that's not what I did. Verse 9, if mine heart hath been deceived by a woman, or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door. He's talking about adultery. Then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. For this is a heinous crime. Yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For it is a fire that consumeth to destruction, and would root out all mine increase. Guys, I want you to understand, judgment's coming, and judgment's happening now. We're being judged in this life for what we do. And whatever you've been dealt, whatever hand you have, wherever you've been called in the Lord, whatever you just do the best you can where you're at, and you commit your works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Job is saying, listen, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm living for God, and I'm working for God. If I committed adultery, then of course I should lose my wife's heart. Or if I sinned against other people's children, then I should lose my children. Or if I use my money for evil, then I should lose all my money. And I'll spare you some of the details, but you should read it for yourself. He goes on and talks about taking care of those that can't help themselves, feeding the fatherless and feeding the widows and making sure his friends are well taken care of, being a very generous person. After all, even though Job was a millionaire, he didn't get there by himself. He got there because of God. And God blessed him to use him to bless other people to keep teaching his word. It's the cycle that God was doing here. Look at verse 24. If I have made gold my hope, 
Or if I have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because mine hand had gotten much. He's, he's talking about, hey, if I was bragging, if I, look, everything I have, I got it. I'm a good guy. I'm a smart guy. Job's saying, listen, that's not, how, that's not how I got it. I'm not trusting in my riches. I can't trust in my riches in eternity. He moves on. Look at verse 29. He says, if I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him, Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. You know, in Proverbs, it tells us not to rejoice when our enemy falls. Job is saying that same concept. He's saying, I'm not rejoicing when my enemy falls. If you've lived long enough, some of your best friends have now become your enemies. And perhaps some of your best friends were now people that were once your enemy. And I think Job realized that if I'm working for God, and I want to be on God's side, and I'm here to build people up, if that guy is rightfully, justifiably my enemy, and I have every reason to be mad at them, but I'm not going to curse them, and I'm not going to wish evil on them, because wouldn't it be great if we could just reconcile, and we both get on God's team, and we both become friends and work for the Lord? I think Job had that foresight of integrity. That even while he was angry, can you imagine somebody did him dirty in business and stole from him, whatever, and instead of him cursing the guy, he said, wait, there's hope. We can learn through this. And we can be reconciled and we can work together for God. Let me pray for that man. Look at verse 30. This is key. Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. You know, you have the power of blessings and cursings in your tongue. Proverbs 18, 21, there's power of death and life in the tongue. And Job says, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to curse this man. Job said, I'm not going to pray in a precatory prayer. That'd be a sin. I'd rather see him as a friend. If you would go to Job 42, and I want to look at the end of his life, Job kept his integrity. Now, if Job, now think about this, guys. If Job was praying for his enemies when they hurt him, and he's feeding the fatherless and the widows, and he's being good to his servants, he's not withholding wages, is one of the things he talked He's paying them a fair wage, and he's taking care of everybody he can, and he's just distributing as much as God gives him, and he's being a blessing to everybody he can. Don't you think Job was a good husband? to his wife. And even in her weakest moment when she was heartbroken and distraught and Satan was attacking his flesh, which also means his wife, he still lovingly, humbly instructed her in the right way and pointed her back to God. Job 42, look at verse number 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. There it is. Job was attacked verbally by his friends and falsely accused. Job prayed for him, and God restored him. Verse 11, Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And just like that, one person after another comes as a good messenger from God saying, hey, Job, I remember when you were good to me and I want to be a blessing to you. Amen. It starts out with Job under attack and one messenger after another saying, hey, you lost it. You've lost this. You've lost that. Your household's gone. Your family's gone. You're under attack. And it ends with him praying for his friends and the friends' acquaintances from time past one after another just come one after another. Here's some money. Here's a blessing. Let me help you. Come on, let's rebuild. Let's reestablish. It's okay, Job. It's going to be all right. God is with you. And sure enough, 
God gave him ten more children. What an awesome story. It starts out in, in Job 2, 3, And the Lord said unto Job, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although you moves me against him to destroy him without cause. When attacks from the devil come, and they will come, just know you can hold your integrity. Don't lose the fear of the Lord. Don't lose the moving of the Holy Spirit. Keep your uprightness. Make sure you remember, you're God's servant. When we get to heaven, and He says to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And then He's going to say, hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none in heaven like him. Boy, what a day that'll be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. And Lord, I just pray that You would help us to remember how Job kept his integrity. And Lord, I pray that You would help that Word become part of who we are. Lord, I ask that You would fill us with Your Holy Spirit and convict us through Your Word and help us to see the areas of our life that we can work. Lord, I know there's things all of us can do. Lord, I just pray that You would help this to be a church of integrity as we honor You. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.